My next guest today is uh, Mark Thorley, expert in scientific data and information management, the head of science information for the UK's Natural Environment Research Council. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Yep. Uh, open access to scholarly articles seems to be well established nowadays, although there are still controversies and different discussions about the best solution in this, in this area. Uh, the relatively new idea of open data seems, on the one hand, to be complementary to open access, but on the other, it's different in terms of the object we want to share. How can we successfully sh uh, share something that is so heterogeneous and complex as, as data? Okay, well, I think I'm going to take issue with your question to start with, in the sense that open access to data in some disciplines has been around for a long time. Um, yes, there is a much more said and talked about and done about open data nowadays, and that's happened over the last few years, but in some areas people have been sharing data successfully. So um, we look at some disciplines like astronomy, like um, atmospheric physics, where they can't do their science without pooling and sharing the data. Um, but the drivers, I think, are now changing. So in the past, the drivers for sharing have been around the requirement to deliver the science and the research. Now there's this recognition that data themselves have a value beyond that which they were collected for. So I've been working in research data management for too long now. I've been doing, I started back in 1990. And that was actually working on a big marine uh, oceanography program in the Antarctic, where a series of cruises done by many nations, including Poland, um, starting in the 70s and running into the 80s, there was an agreement even then to share the data to actually deliver better research. Um, <coughs> you know, so people have been sharing data for a long time. Now, the driver nowadays is more around what I would call the research integrity debate. How can we validate and reproduce research? Um, and there's been a very good report about that from the Royal Society in the UK, produced in 2012, called Science as an Open Enterprise. And then additionally, there's been a recognition over the past few years, partly driven by what you might call the big data revolution, that data themselves have a reuse potential. Um, so it's then, it's recognising what data can be used for what purpose. I think yeah, data are a different object to a research publication. And I think we have to recognise that some data have potentially more value than other data. So in my role at Natural Environment Research Council, I spend a lot of time working with our innovation team who are responsible for trying to ensure that the research that NERC undertakes is actually taken into industry, taken into the, the SME, small and medium enterprises, taken into entrepreneurs to do stuff with. One of the key areas we're working on is actually making innovative use of the data we generate outside of the research. So to trying to get data used by um, by insurance industries, by um, people who deliver uh, content-based services, etc. And the evidence from that is that they're very interested in some sorts of data, but not all sorts of data. So what we're seeing is they want where there's a market where, where there's a market for data, they're interested in data. And they in the environmental side that tends to be things around um, what's the weather going to do? What is the environment like in a particular position? What's the geology like? Is my if I buy a house, is it going to fall into a hole in the ground? Kind of thing. Um, but unfortunately, and I get booed and hissed when I and I'll say this, you know, in other presentations, I think we have to recognise that not all research data is going to have such a useful long-term value in terms of innovation but it may still be needed to be managed and made available to help support the reproducibility of research. Um, 
so when you go back to your question about how we can encourage the sharing of these different sort of objects, I'm a great believer in domain-specific repositories. So within NERC, um, I'm responsible for overseeing the work of our network environmental data centres. So we have five main environmental data centres where we pool the data of particular types together. So you get experts who understand the domain working with data. And what we find we can do is, certainly in environmental contexts, we tend to pool the parameters out of individual data sets to build up composite data sets of specific parameters like ocean temperature like uh, salinity, ocean salinity, um, like uh, you know, ground stability or contaminated land data. So by experts pulling up individual research data sets, then pulling components out of those data, then we can build up what we tend to call more consistent data sets, which we then find are of more use, especially for people um, both in the innovation environment, but also in, in the wider research environment. But these, again, are very much domain-specific. So the examples I look across are very much around environmental sciences, where there has been a recognition for many years of the value of data. But even there, in some experimental data, I think we have to recognise it will be very difficult to share those data. It actually might be more efficient if you want another data set to actually recreate data rather than to, to use an older data set. Um, so in terms of going back to how we share these complex objects, it's around ensuring we have sufficient descriptors, documentation about the data, which is difficult, which is time consuming, and then to ensure, I'd say, that the users of those data have, you know, are intelligent in their own right. We need to ensure the users of the data actually understand the domain as well. They don't go into it blind. If they do, you know, they, or they need to be assisted by domain specialists in using it more effectively. Okay, so uh, what is the best medium to effectively distribute data? Would it be uh, repositories or would it be data journals? What's your recommendation? Yeah. Well, I would say, being awkward, I'd say both because they're different things. Um, data journals to me especially, are ways of describing data that you put effort into working up, documenting, etc., and getting credit for that. So it's a way of writing about a data set, getting that peer-reviewed in some sense, and then published to a wider community. But not all data sets are going to be suitable for documentation, or maybe of interest, particular data journals. Um, but they're a good way of signposting um, information about data sets, especially ones where a lot of effort has gone into creating, curating, um, pulling the data set together. Whereas repositories are a very good, or either domain specific or institution, are a good way of holding data and being the physical gateway to those. And with appropriate metadata, those data will be good become discoverable. The difference is between going direct to repository, you'll get a certain level of discovery metadata, a certain level of provenance information, etc. But it, I would probably argue it won't be at the same level, level as you might get with a, a well-written data paper about that data set. Um, so to me, they're two, they're two tools in the toolbox. Of, of doing data distribution. And it will very much depend on um, the resources available and the perceived value of those data from the researchers themselves. Um, quite often the data repository will be there to support an underpinning publication. So the research paper itself will be useful supporting information for the data set out the repository. Whereas I think you'll tend to find those data sets which are described in data papers quite often will be bigger than any one particular publication. They will have a, a life in their own right, you might say. Let's talk about incentives. Okay. Uh, scientists need incentives to open their work, uh, to make articles freely available, to assure the data, and what sort of bait can we think of when we want to stimulate this uh, broad uh, data sharing? 
Okay, well, I can wear several hats when I answer this question, one of which is I work for a research funder. So as a research funder, we have a policy. We say, if you want to take our money, we expect you to do certain things. At the moment, we expect you, certainly with my funder, we expect you to offer a copy of the data you collect to one of our data centres. If we think they're of long-term value, we'll work with you to determine whether they're of value. We'll expect that data to be deposited within the data centre for the lot, and we will then manage and make it available for the long term. Unfortunately, some of our researchers still have trouble doing that. They see it as a difficult extra step. Um, but as a funder, I can say, well, if you don't do it, you won't get your next grant. Um, we, you know, people talk about sticks and carrots. I see this as a very big carrot I hit someone with. Kind of <laughs> um, more seriously, um, we, we look at incentives around data citation, um, where researchers, the currency of reward, so to speak, in, in research is getting your paper cited and used by others. So therefore this concept of publishing data sets or information about data sets in data journals can lead to the data paper itself getting citations so you get recognition as a data scientist for the work you've put in working the data up. We need to find other ways of giving recognition, say for those data sets, say looking at alternative metrics in the way we can download, people download and use data sets from repositories. Um, the work at Thomson Reuters have been doing our data citation index, I think still in very early days, but again it's an example of other tools that can be used. So we have to find incentives, but my feeling is to some extent they are I won't say short-term solutions. They're helping to get the, the philosophy of data better data management, good data sharing, better embedded within, to, within the research culture. The only way it will work in the long term is when it is done freely as part of the process of doing research. So where researchers actually say, hang on a minute, my research isn't finished until I have worked my data up, written the various the supporting information, and then lodged for data in an appropriate repository or data centre. In the same way, no reasonable researcher nowadays would say, oh, I've done the research, but I can't be bothered to publish it. It's just too much time consuming. I'll go on and do the next research. There probably are a few researchers like that, but the majority of the researchers recognise it's an integral part of the research process, is publishing your research. More researchers nowadays are, are recognising now that an integral part of the research process is doing the data step, but that has to be just become, it's what I call the warp and weft. It has to be integrated into the fabric of the research process. Um, and we can only do that when, by example, when researchers realise that that is what research means in a modern digital age. And it's not just the sharing thing. Sharing is a byproduct of it. I think to me it's also this whole area of reproducibility, validity of research. Research in a digital age I think is fundamentally different from what you might call traditional research. And researchers are start some researchers are now starting to recognise that, that they just have to make their data open to allow others to, to do that validation, that reproducibility step, or just to prove that their research is there open and honest. It's no, long, it's no good now to say, trust me, trust my results, I'm a researcher, I've got the PhD, you can trust me, you know. Um, or, yeah, you can have the data if I can find them again. You know, what does that say about your, your, your strengths, your qualities as a researcher? So, long term, short term incentives, long term it has to be built into the fabric and the process and the mindset of doing research. So let's talk now about uh, <coughs> policy and funding, mm. okay? Uh, open access, open data, open science in general is a long-term project and it needs long-term funding. And on the other hand, the European Commission uh, presents open science as a tool to foster innovation. My question is, how can a solid funding for open science projects be maintained in collaboration with the private sector? What's the optimal solution here, in your opinion? Well, 
Okay, what do you mean by open science projects? Is there something special about open science which requires additional funding as opposed to just funding for science, for research in general? I mean the open science infrastructure in general. Like okay. We have different projects. We have open air, for example, to preserve data sets, to, uh, to provide this long-term policy. Yeah. Uh, I think you need finances, you need funding. Okay, and, uh, so, so wearing um, my hat as a, someone who works for research funders involved in policy development, um, we have to recognise in the long term that dissemination of research results, be that the research paper through open access, the research data through data centres and repositories, is part of the process of doing research. It's not an add-on extra that is funded independently of research. It's core to the process of research. Therefore, in the long term, the costs of maintaining the necessary research infrastructures to support that fall firmly on the shoulders of those who fund research. And research funders have got to recognise that and have got to step up to the mark and contribute their fair share of those costs. So that's something, you know, as funders in the UK, we are already doing that. You know, the research councils, uh, NERC is one of seven of the UK's research councils, we now put considerable amount of money into funding open access um, because we recognise, yes, it's part of the money that could otherwise be spent be doing research projects, but it is part of the cost of doing research. Yeah, in the longer term we have to work out with institutions exactly where these costs lie, but to me it's not sustainable to do it by special funding through special projects like open air. Open air, things like that, Recode have always been very good at helping move the agenda along, saying what needs to be done, starting to develop initial what I might call pathfinder infrastructures, etc. But in the long term, going back to my answer to the previous question, it just has to become part of the warp and weft, part of the fabric of research. So, and that goes down to the people who fund research, which is governments have to recognise that a necessary part of research infrastructures is having the facilities there to do data sharing, to do open data, to do open access to publications. And we have to recognise that actually research in a digital age, modern open, inverted commas, research, could actually cost more than what you might call more traditional, closed isn't quite the right word, but less sharing sort of research, where you just publish the paper and the data were, you know, look hopefully held somewhere but they may you know in the old days they'd be published actually in the back of the journal paper as a series of tables etc and i think we just have to recognize that we will probably end up doing a slightly smaller slightly fewer research but better research projects provided the pot of money available <laughs> remains about the same so paul is currently working in this area is mm. working on a new uh law that would allow scientists, force them to uh, open data, to open articles. And uh, what should we especially remember about when adopting this new law? Where should we start? So you, you mentioned <laughs> that, but uh, maybe you have some sort of uh, a recommendation. Okay, I guess from experience in the UK is that at the end of the day you have to put your money where your mouth is. It's no good enacting a law, or in the UK we enacted, you know, the research funders enacted a policy across the research councils around open access and, and moving towards open data. If you're going to do that, you have to provide the necessary resources to make sure it's going to happen. There's a wonderful word called hortatorial. Otherwise, it becomes just a hortatorial policy. I, we talk about it. It sounds someone, a minister stands up, makes a very grand speech, but nothing happens. So it's a difference between talking about it and doing it. And it's to have the resources there. And it's not just money. It's the it all boils down to money at the end of the day. But it's having the people there. It's having the people who are enthused enough 
to try and make it happen as well. Um, so it's building that, that corpus of expertise about advising people. I think it's having positive examples of showing how things have worked. I think it's working with you know, early adopters like the UK, like um, some of the work that's been done in the US, etc. Working with those people, you know, those examples where stuff has already been done and worked and showing how it can then be applied, say, within, within the Polish context. But at the end of the day, it boils down to resources. If you're going to make a policy in this, if you want it to work, it has to be resourced. You know, be that resources to build data management infrastructures, to provide the training, to provide the support workers, etc. And certainly in terms of open access uh, journals, you know, to provide the money to pay for publication costs, etc. Mark, thank you very much for your time and this interesting conversation. My pleasure.